Good evening. Hi, guys. This is going to be a really content rich presentation this evening. I'm still letting people in as we speak. So uh, great to see everybody here. If you're in property, no matter how large or small scale, or you were just thinking about property, this is the presentation for you. I'm really pleased we have not only a business associate in mind, but somebody I'm proud to call a very good friend. Jalil wasn't born into property. He didn't come from a property dynasty. He didn't inherit a portfolio. He didn't study property at college or university, but has built a sizable and profitable business from scratch. I've watched him develop over the past few years, and we are all lucky he is here to share his journey tonight. Can I kindly ask you to remain on mute during the presentation with your camera turned off? We will have a full question and answer session afterwards where you have the opportunity to pose any question you may have property related to Jalil. So without further ado, I would like to welcome Jalil Mia. Everyone, I give you Jalil from Cardiff. Hi, everyone. Uh, firstly, I'd like to thank everyone who's taken the time to listen to me on this webinar. And I'd like to thank Ben and Jamie for giving me the platform to share my journey. Uh, ben is a close friend of mine, someone who I admire and respect in the property industry, a very shrewd property investor. And over the years, every time I've spoken about a property deal with Ben, he's always given me good advice. So um, when he asked me to come on the webinar, I was more than happy to do so. So what I'm going to do today is just share my property journey of, you know, how it started, uh, the good, the bad, the ugly, and how I got to where I am. So just a quick little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Jalil Mia. I live in Cardiff. Um, I have a small property portfolio of about 60 rental units. I've built most of that up over the last couple of years, uh, mainly using creative strategies, uh, which I've learned from my mistakes in the past. So um, I'll take you right back to the beginning and I'll do like a timeline of over the years to the present uh, moment where I am. Right, so right back to the beginning. Um, I was born in 1982. Uh, in a rural village in Bangladesh. I came to the UK when I was about three or four years old. Um, I left high school in 1997 and I went to work in a restaurant with my older brother straight after high school. I worked in various uh, restaurants and takeaways then um, for a couple of years. And in 2003, I um, saved up a bit of money I leased a premises and I opened my own Indian takeaway business. In 2004, I bought my first rental property, um, which was a three bed ender terrace for 82,000 um, pounds. Just done a bit of cosmetic work, a uh, bit of painting, decorating, uh, clearing out and just new carpets. Um, probably spent about 1500 quid, um, did practically a lot of the work myself. And after six months, I sold the property for 110,000. And that's when something just clicked. Like I couldn't believe that I did that because up until that point, I had never made money like that. So, um, you know, it gave me the belief then that this is something I could do. I could make money from property. And then, um, you know, in 2000 and uh, four and five, I did another two, three of these deals. And, um, you know, I, I made money off them. And to be honest, I got kind of a little bit carried away because obviously at that time, uh, 2004, 2005, the property market was just rising. Uh, property prices were just increasing. But um, I kind of thought that it was me. I thought that I, I, I was responsible for it all because um, I was buying these kind of cheap properties in a certain area in Cardiff and um, doing minor works to them and then selling them again um, within a year for quite a good bit of profit. So, um, you know, I just thought that I was a property expert, that I knew everything. 
uh, that I needed to know in property and I couldn't go wrong. And um, to tell you the truth, that was quite a good strategy I had because I picked a certain area where the properties were cheap. Um, you know, the maintenance and work on them you didn't have to really do it to a very high standard. And um, then they would sell pretty quick as well because they were still cheap to buy. Um, but, you know, at the time, you don't know what you don't know. And um, I kind of got bored quick because I started to kind of chase the next thing then, thinking what, what's the next uh, strategy in property to kind of make money from. And um, at that time, back in 04, 05, there was all these new bills popping up everywhere, off-plan properties. And um, the word apartments started to appear because before we used to just call them houses and flats. And um, I, I kind of got swayed kind of with the shiny penny syndrome, you can say, go into see all these show homes in these new apartments where, you know, the developers had paid a lot of money to have them staged and looking like really presentable and modern. And um, I started to think that, OK, I can make money from these new builds. I can buy them, you know, brand new off plan. I didn't have to do any refurb to them. And within about a year, I can sell them again for a profit. But at that time, I didn't realize that, you know, new build properties, when you're buying them, you're buying them really kind of above market value. And they're never going to look like what the show homes look like. And there's very little scope to add value to them compared to normal houses. But I didn't know that at the time. So in 2006, I had... Uh, just in one four bedroom property that I bought and I was going to sell it, but I tenanted it and I started looking at these new builds. So then I bought uh, a new build apartment in quite a nice area of Cardiff. Um, and I paid, I think we have 150,000 for a two bedroom. And the plan was to hold it for like a year and then sell it. And then I saw another one bedroom coming up in another nice area of Cardiff. And I thought, yeah you know i'll i'll buy that as well and um i bought i think 135,000 the one bed and then i got a bit of carried away because i was i was looking at these properties and i was thinking yeah well you know i'm going to only make about probably tw 20k um sorry my phone rang then um i i'm only going to make about 20k maybe 30k on these properties and um I started to kind of look across the pond towards London because everybody was saying in London, you make, you know, major money off property. You can sell one property and make a hundred grand. So I kind of started to run before I could walk um, looking back at it. And I started looking at the London property market thinking, you know, can I get a slice of that pie? So, um, you know, in London at that time, you know, new builds were booming and, I kind of started to look around Canary Wharf and I saw this um, new build going up and it was really fancy. It was uh, one of the tallest residential towers in the city of London at that time. And it was off plan, completely off plan. So it hadn't been built yet. And, you know, there was like a kind of a big hype around it because it had, um, it had like a, a cinema for the residents. It had, you know, a, cocktail bar on the 48th floor I had some fancy restaurant and it was just like you know it really made you feel like oh if you put your money into this you're going to get a big return from it so I remember driving to London to Canary Wharf um, and I was kind of just way out of my area just trying to you know go into somewhere where I didn't really have much knowledge but I was just kind of chasing the money because I thought this is where you make you know the big money fast and I um I went to uh, this uh, new development in London. I can remember they kind of I met them on the river, and they took me in a speedboat um, with TVs and the headrest of the speedboat up along the river to a glass show house. And you go in, and it was like champagne reception, and you know all these like European sales, you know people speaking in like European accents, and it made you feel like you know this is one of the best investments you're going to ever have. And I remember I took the brochure and then they said, like, you can call, um, you know, they're going to start selling the apartments in like a couple of weeks. 
And I remember ringing uh, the sales number and every time I rang, they were selling them floor by floor. So the first day I rang, it was like the first floor and it was sold out. Um, you know, the second day I rang, second floor sold out, third day sold out. And I can remember then, um, I rang them probably about 10, 10 days and they, they were just saying to me, they sold out. I, I don't know if that was a marketing tactic or, you know, if they generally probably were selling them out because at that time the property market was really hot. And um, I kind of managed to get in on the 21st floor. So I bought a studio apartment on the 21st floor for 311000 And the way it worked was in 2006, you put down uh, 10%. And then in 2007, you put down 10%. And then in 2009, it would actually be complete. And then you get an 80% loan to value mortgage and the apartment is yours. My plan was, you know, this was in 06 now. And I thought by the time 09 comes around, what I'm going to do before I actually complete on it, I'll put it back on the market for sale. And I was expecting to make about you know, 80, 90 K on it. I thought I'll, I'll list it for 400 and, you know, I can make a quite a bit of money um, just by not doing much. So that was the plan. And um, I put down 10% in 2006, 2007 came round. Um, I, I kind of had my money tied up because I bought these two new bills and I had another four bed property as well, which I hadn't sold. So I ended up taking a secured loan on my parents' property to get another 32000 to put down for the second deposit, another 10% in 2007. And at that time, I was still confident that, you know, I was going to get a very good return from this property. Um, and then 2008 kind of crept in and, you know, we start to see, you know, in America, the banks collapsing and mortgage lenders, you know, pulling from market and, you know, house prices slowly starting to dip. And they're kind of like a little kind of sense of fear start coming as if, you know, is something going to go wrong? And I can remember the two new bills that I bought. I tried to put them back on the market, but the estate agents, they were kind of saying to me, they're only kind of worth what I paid for them. So the two bed, they were saying it's still probably, worth. I, I bought it for 150. They were saying it's probably worth 145 if I want to sell it. And the one bed, they were saying, you know, I, I think I paid uh, 135, they're saying about 130. And then um, I was thinking, all right, I'll probably hold on to them. And, you know, the, the value will increase then. And then, you know, I think my mortgage broker shut up his shop as well then. He closed down. And, um, you know, that's when I knew something was wrong. I had a, I had a gut feeling that, you know, something bad is going to happen. Um, and then 2009 came in, and I remember I was supposed to cle uh, complete in the second quarter of 2009. And by then, I think my new bills, the two new bills I bought, they dropped even further in value. They had gone down even more. Um, and then this property in London, I remember it was complete, and the uh, developers got in touch with me and said, you know, your apartment's ready. You can book in a valuation. And I had a mortgage in principle uh, agreed, I think it was Barclays, um, which was the lender. And the surveyor went out and he only valued the apartment I was buying for 250,000. So, um, you know, my deposit that I put in the 62,000 just kind of disappeared overnight. And the, the apartment was worth 20% less than what I agreed to buy in 2006. I kind of went back to the developer and um, I kind of pleaded with them to say like, look, is there any way that I can, you know, use my deposit to purchase for 250 and then work out some kind of payment plan to pay them back the difference, the deposit amount over a couple of years, but they weren't having any of it. They were just like, you know, you need to pay us the other 250,000, you know, you've paid us 20%, we need the other 80%. So it came to a point where, I was quite stressed and I even said to them, I said, look, keep my deposit and just let me walk away from the contract. And they said, no, they said, you know, you, you owe us 250,000, you know, you need to pay it. And then um, I remember I went to all these solicitors in Cardiff and I showed them my contract. Um, I had two contracts, one when I exchanged and then one uh, 
when the apartment was ready upon completion. And I showed these contracts to all these different solicitors and everybody just said to me, you know, there's nothing you could do. You're tied in. You can't get out of the contract. You, you need to complete um, or you need to pay them their money. And um, then I think where I wasn't um, moving forward, I received a big uh, bundle in the post and these like, you know, court papers, they were taking me to court and, you know, they were going to file for bankruptcy unless I paid them. And at that time, I didn't have the money to pay him. I didn't have, you know, 250000 to pay him. And, um, you know, these two new bills, I, I was kind of desperately trying to sell them. I think the two bed, you know, they were saying it was only valued then at like 125000 And the one bed, it was only valued at like 120000 So I was in negative equity with them too. And then the four bed property that I had, um, I rented to a family and I can remember it was towards, I think it was like Christmas time in 2009. Um, I had a phone call from the tenant who moved in with a woman with, I think, three or four kids. And she'd had uh, some argument with her boyfriend who moved in after. She was my tenant and her boyfriend moved in after into the property. And they had some domestic, you know, argument. And I think, you know, he, whatever happened, I'm not sure, but she left. She said he beat her up and she had to leave the property. And then I got the phone call from the boyfriend who said, um, you know, that he wanted the deposit. It was £800 deposit and it was £800 monthly rent. And he wanted me to give him the deposit. And I said to him, look, you're not my tenant. You know, the lady was my tenant. If she asked me for the deposit, I'll give it back to her. But she owned me one month rent that she didn't pay. So I, I shouldn't be given the deposit anyway. And she's left the property. And I think this guy, he just got really pissed off. And he was just like, are you going to give me the deposit? I was like, no. And then what he did was set fire to the house. So uh, he lit a fire in the hallway. Um, and that was it. He, he just left the property. And the whole property was damaged. The whole staircase was burnt. Luckily, the roof or nothing got burnt. But inside a four-bed house, every room had smoke damage and it was just a complete mess. You know, the fire engines came and, you know, they hosed the property down, but the property was just, you know, complete in ruin. Um, and to top it all off as well, I, I didn't have building insurance. Um, I did have, I think, expired. I didn't renew it. So I had no building insurance. So, you know, 2009 ended up with um, me having two new build properties, which were negative equity. Um, one property burnt, uh, with no insurance. And I had one off plan property in London, which was worth 20% less than what I agreed to buy it for. So I think it was kind of at that moment, like the penny dropped and I realized that, you know, I'm not a property expert and what I was thinking that I know everything about property. I actually don't. Um, you know, there's a lot more to learn because if I did know everything, I wouldn't be in this position. You know, I wouldn't be in a position where, you know, I'm feeling so low. So, um, you know, I can remember I, I kind of started to expect family and friends to help me out. And, you know, I was kind of telling my sad story to everyone about the position I'm in and, you know, can someone help me? And all anyone ever said to me was just, you know, this is the um, amount of help I got was, People just said, you know, we feel sorry for you. That was it. And then I kind of realized that I can't expect anyone else to get me out of this mess because it was me who put myself into this mess. So it was only me who can get myself out. So then I started to think, you know, what can I do? There must be something I can do. And 2010 came in then and I started to research online um, and I found, you know, there was property meetings and networking events, which I never knew about. And I think the first one I went to was in Birmingham. And when I went to the property event, you know, the people in the room, I kind of met some people and they said, where are you from? I said, Cardiff. And they said, oh, so what are you doing in Birmingham? Why don't you go to the events in Cardiff? And I had no idea there was property events in Cardiff. So, um, you know, I, I started going to a couple of property events in Cardiff and I met a few uh, people who weren't a property. And then I kind of started to build up the courage again to, you know, sort this mess out that I was in. Um, 
So I thought, you know what, I'm going to take it one at a time. I'm going to do one thing at a time. So first it was uh, this four bed property that had uh, burned down. I think I was in about 10 months arrears with the bank and they took me to court. I went to a civil court um, because they wanted to repossess the property. Um, But what what I did with that one then, I had a little bit of money um, and I borrowed some more money and I turned that into two two bed flats. So I'd done a two bed flat on the ground floor and a two bed flat on the first floor and it cash flowed really well then and it cash flowed enough money to pay back the money that I'd spent uh, doing the refurb on it. And it didn't really cost that much more than if I would have refurb just the four bedroom house, um, you know, the quotes that I had. So when I turned into two two bed flats, uh, the cash flow made a huge difference. And then the two bed um, fl- apartment that I had, I was in negative equity. Um, but I remember actually ringing all these um, kind of property companies at the time, you know, these home buyers and you know property fast buyer you know companies like who buy your house quick and stuff like that and I remember I, I was ringing all these companies because I was a motivated seller and I was trying to sell you know all the property that I had at the time I was trying to sell the one in London the you know four bed house which was burned the two bed flat the one bed flat and all these people they were kind of just saying to me oh we'll give you like 60 percent of market value 70 percent of market value they wasn't really understanding my uh, pain and my position um you know that I was in so I kind of just took it upon myself then to say right you know I'll, I'll sort out myself um so I did the four bed house into two two bed flats the two bed apartment and one bed apartment I found professional tenants who paid me a higher rent and they started to cash flow so I thought I can just you know hold these they wash in their face and the one in London which was giving me the most headache um I wasn't really sure how to do anything about that one, but what I did, I went online and there was, um, I found an online forum that like there was, I think about 750 apartments in total in these two towers. And there was a lot of buyers who were in the same position as me, who had put down huge deposits, you know, on uh, apartments. And, you know, some of these apartments went well excess of seven figures. Um, And, I kind of joined the forum and I started to communicate with people on the forum. And there was a meeting in London in uh, the Hilton Hotel in Canary Wharf um, in 2010, where some of the buyers were going to get together and they were going to meet in person from this forum. So I, I drove to London um, to the Hilton and I met, you know, quite a few other um, people who were buyers and in a very similar position as myself. And, you know, we all kind of formed a group and I think it was about 21 of us to begin with. Um, And what we decided is that as a collective, we're going to pool our funds together and build a legal case against this developer and try and get our deposits back. So out of the 21, five of us formed a committee and I was one of the committee members. So it was me, um, an eye surgeon, uh, investment banker, IT specialist and a lawyer. So the five of us were the committee. And at that time, I think I was probably about 25 years old. So I was still very green. didn't know a lot about property or business, but these people were, you know, established business people in London and they were kind of in their forties, fifties and sixties. And then what we would do um, every couple of months, we would meet in Chelsea at the eye surgeon's uh, house and we would discuss, uh, you know, our options of what we could do to get our money back from this developer. And, you know, looking back at it now, that was kind of like my own little mastermind, you know, with these, uh, you know, like educated business people and I was learning a lot from them and we hired a litigation solicitor we hired a QC uh, from the chambers in Holborn and I remember the QC his fees were five grand per hour plus VAT you know for his work and you know all this was new to me like I'd, I'd never been in this kind of environment and surroundings before with these type of people but I learned a lot learned a lot going there and sitting around these people and kind of you know, brainstorming ideas. And we, you know, went to see the QC in his chambers. And, you know, he was very expensive, but to be honest with you, he was worth the money because he found a common argument that all of us can use in court against his developer to get all our deposits back. And he found a glitch in the contracts. So 
we went back uh, with our solicitor to the developer and, you know, we kind of argued this case to uh, the developer that the QC had found and said, you know, there was a, a common argument we had here, but the developer laughed at us, you know, said, look, that don't make sense, uh, you know, we'll see you in court. So, um, you know, we kind of stuck together and we still push forward, push forward, and we were willing to go to court as well to argue our case because we did have a strong argument. Um, and I can remember then 2011 uh, came in and I think our court date was in May 2011. And it was quite weird because out of the 21 of us, the developer had started to kind of do this divide and conquer tactic where they were picking on everyone individually and they picked off, they even tried it with me, but I kind of, I was one of the committee, I stuck with the group. But out of the 20, 21 of us, I think about four or five had kind of been picked off or scared off with, you know, by the developer and there were 16 of us left. Um, so a few days before the court date, you know, we had an email uh, from our solicitor saying, you know, the developers offered you, um, I think it was 500,000 cash, you know, between all of you, um, just as a cash settlement, not to go to court. So then we all kind of started, you know, email each other, call each other and, you know, think, you know what, they obviously know that if we go to court, our argument will probably win and it can open a can of worm for them. So they're trying to like pay us hush money now, not to go to court. And for the last two years, they've been threatening us with bankruptcy and, you know, it's just been giving us a hard time. And now, you know, they're paying us money just to kind of not go to court. So there's that saying, isn't it? You, you never accept the first offer. So we all kind of said, look, you know, turn it down. Let's see what they can offer us a, be a better deal. So we turned that down and then we said, look, we're not happy with our offer. You know, we want a better deal. So they came straight back. They came straight back with, with a two bed duplex apartment um, worth, I think it was like just over a million. Um, and they said, you know, you can have this apartment, we'll put in an SPV, uh, you know, you could be shareholders and you can own the apartment outright. And then I can remember the group was kind of divided because half the people wanted to take the deal and half were kind of sitting on the fence thinking, should we ask for more? And I can remember kind of saying to Evan, listen, we've got nothing to lose. Let's just ask for a better deal because they really don't want us to go to court. Um, so, you know, if, if they don't agree to anything else, we got this deal on the table. So we went back and we said, look, we're not happy with this. You know, we want something better. And then the developer came back and they offered us a, a three bed penthouse on the 44, 44th floor, a triple balcony. Um, they gave us a, an extra car park in space, which was worth uh, 40 grand. They give us 50 grand to furnish the apartment with the interior design uh, company they were using. They gave us three years uh, service charge free and three years ground rent free and, and they were gonna pay all the legals. So like this offer in total was worth over 2 million pound. And then we all kind of looked at each other and thought, you know what, we'll be stupid not to accept this. So we accepted it and we got a really nice apartment um, in Canary Wharf overlooking the O2 arena, um, you know, with no mortgage, no, nothing owed on it between, um, you know, wh whoever was in the group equivalent to our shares um, that we had put in uh, into this company. And then, um, you know, that was quite a good result to kind of have that after all these years of, you know, thinking that, you were going to be taken to court and you know made bankrupt by this developer it actually turned out to be quite a good result and this apartment then we rented it to west ham uh football club uh for eight grand a month uh rent and they put in sam allardyce uh who was the coach for west ham at the time and yeah it, it was just a good investment it just actually turned out to be a very good investment um so the plan was we had this company formed and we were all shareholders of this company. And what we all agreed at the start was that we would hold it for three years. And after three years, the property will automatically go back on the market and 
whatever the best offer is that we would get in, we would all cash out and get our money. So that's what we did. We, um, you know, we rented the property for three years. We had a good rental income. And after three years, you know, we put the property on the market. And I can remember that we had a, a very interesting offer. I think we property, the property was on the market for 1.8 million. And we had a Chinese buyer uh, from Hong Kong and he, he he came to see the apartment in about 20 minutes. He looked at it, he said he'll buy it all cash, 1.6 million. And we all kind of looked at each other and thought, well, you know, should we accept, should we not? But this guy, he was a very good negotiator. He said to the estate agent um, who was marking the property for us, listen, I'll complete uh, on this apartment within a week. You'll have the funds, all cash. Um, but he said, I'm getting on my private jet, um, flying to Hong Kong. When I land in Hong Kong, all I want to hear is a yes or a no. That was it. No small talk, no negotiating. He just said yes or no. Cash, 1.6 million. So when we all kind of heard that, we thought, you know what, we've been waiting so long to get our money out of this property or from this developer that it would be nice to actually be, you know, finally get paid. So we agreed and we said, yeah, look, uh, we'll take the offer. And um, then I can remember it was 2015. We actually um, got the money pretty quick. It was like, literally, I think it was a week and, you know, the money was in our bank accounts. So that was a good feeling. That was a good feeling. I, and I hadn't bought no property for, you know, quite a few years since like, you know, 2008 or nine, I think it was the last time. And then I hadn't bought nothing. I was just kind of, you know, educating myself a little bit about property. Um, but I didn't buy anything. But now I had a bit of money. Um, you know, I, I had a share from that money. It was just a percentage I had. Um, but it was enough to start buying properties again in South Wales. So I thought to myself, this time I'm going to start doing it right. And I had a plan. So my plan was to look for distressed properties, you know, really run down properties, um, large properties and convert them to HMOs um, or flats. So th that's what I did. I um, I think I bought it was a six bed property in Newport. I converted to an eight bed HMO. Uh, then I bought uh, like a five bed property, convert, converted that to a six bed HMO. And what I started to do then from 2015 is just do like one deal at a time. I wasn't like, you know, going too fast. I was just every year I was doing about, you know, maybe one to three deals maximum within the year. Um, but you know, I, I was I was doing them and making sure that they were complete, they were done, they were cash flowing, they had profit, equity, you know, ticked all the boxes, and then I'd move to the next deal. And then I started to um, kind of, I, I, I'd done a few of them, and I, I started to approach uh, vendors directly, you know, people who own properties. And I just, I, I, I kind of found people who were having a difficult time with the property, uh, you know, it might've been a large property that they were trying to sell, um, or just something that I needed a lot of work or something even when they had problem with tenants. And I was kind of approaching them with uh, lease options and ex exchange and complete com uh, exchange and delayed completions. So, um, you know, I started to apply these strategies then and they, people started to, you know, uh, agree to them. And I, I, I done quite a few of these. And then um, I even start to approach uh, estate agents then in, I think it was 2018 and 2019. I'd done one with Darlow's, which was a detached, uh, huge property. Um, and it was just something which was derelict and no one was buying it. I'd done an exchange of de delayed completion where I fully gutted it. Um, and I was able to then buy it at the higher uh, market value. Um, and then I'd done one with uh, Peter Allen as well, um, which was two, two duplex um, flats that, I was able to do work in before and I bought at a discount. Um, but yeah, I just, I just carried on then. I just, I, even through COVID, I, um, I didn't stop. I was flat out through COVID. I think, you know, I, I, I done more property deals than I had ever done. And um, I just built a portfolio. I just built it to a really good size where um, last year, 2022 was probably the first, uh, year in about since 2015 till 2022 
last year I didn't buy any property. I kind of just took the whole year out. You know, I took the whole year off and um, I traveled a lot. I took the family away. I'd done a few bucket list uh, things that I wanted to do. And I turned 40 last year as well. But um, I had enough income from the property portfolio, which was a mixture um, of all different types. I had shops, commercial units with flats above, uh, HMOs, flats, houses, apartments, just a mixture of properties, um, totaling about 60 rental units, which gave me enough uh, cash flow to kind of travel and do things I wanted to do without worrying about, you know, income. And it's like last year was a good year because I kind of enjoyed the fruits of my labor. And then it kind of made me realize that, you know, I could do this, but I need to do this properly. And I really need to know what I'm doing. And also last year was a bit choppy because, you know, the property market did change a lot last year. So I'm quite glad I didn't buy anything last year. Um, but yeah, and then that's what brought me to this year now. And, you know, we're still quite uncertain, uh, the market, but I've got a couple of offers pending and I'm looking at a few deals. But that's my journey up until the present moment. And, you know, I don't think I'm a, you know, successful property investor yet I just feel like that I've just taken the first step I've just reached the first step so like now I'm quite fortunate that I'm in a position where I can kind of sit back and look at property deals and you know I can take my time with stuff I'm not rushing I'm not chasing and I've learned from my mistakes you know about getting into, involved into things too quickly without understanding them that now you know what I've done in the last few years have all worked out really well and has really helped me to get to where I am today. So that's my journey in a nutshell. And, um, you know, I'd be happy if anyone had any questions to ask um, or if someone wanted any advice that I can uh, maybe give, I'd be more than happy to help. Wow, Jalil, thank you so much for sharing that. Guys, most of this story I do know, and that's why I had to get Jalil on this webinar. What a story. I mean, you know, talk about EastEnders, Coronation Street, Emmerdale. We got it wrapped into one here, the drama. One thing has proved true. Jalil is so resilient in what he does. He never, never gives up. And it's what I say to people who are on my mentorship programs with me. Never, ever give up because there will always be the golden line for those that have got the perseverance, those who have got the vim, the vigour to move forward. I mean, you know, just take a couple of things that Janelle highlighted there. Talk about pressure, right? What's pressure on you? Pressure is probably when you've got a secured loan on your parents' house during a credit crunch. Pressure is having a new build house burned down with no building insurance. The list goes on. But what a wonderful story. And Janelle, thank you again. Thank you again. Has anyone got any questions okay. for Jalil at this point in time? There's a lot of people on here and everyone's very quiet. <laughs> Jalil, what would you say would be your biggest triumph? I think I know what it might be, but just tell me what you think your biggest triumph actually was from adversity. Um, I, I think it's what you said earlier, just not giving up, really. Not giving up. Um, just sticking to it because there was many moments um, at the beginning that I could have given up and just I probably wouldn't be what I am today if I had and there was a lot of time that I was literally that close you know I was very close but I just stuck with it I just stuck with it and I seen you know people who were a lot more you know wealthier than me more knowledge like bigger business people give up I, I seen them you know just giving up and you know just calling it quits because I stuck through with it and I just kind of persevered and persevered and persevered, I think kind of it just got me through the worst part. And then when things started going good, I didn't take it for granted, but I just knew that things could go bad as well. So I kind of did everything uh, knowing what I'm doing, not just kind of gambling or, you know, wishing on luck. You know, I, I was kind of in control of everything I was doing and just doing it slowly, not rushing it. Indeed, indeed. That's that's a fantastic testimonial. I mean, let's just go back to the London deal, the new building in London. That was quite a ballsy deal to do. 
especially at the age that you were at that two point in time. But let's just talk about that in greater detail, because what I want everyone to know is when you say you paid the QC a lot of money, how much did he charge? I, can't, I, I think the total bill was about 70K. Right. Because uh, it was split between a group of us. It wasn't too bad. So, so many people will turn around to you and say, Jalil, that's such a waste of money. It's such a lot of money. You shouldn't have spent that. But in a snapshot, where did it take you from? It took you from a loss of what to a gain of what over the term, would you say? Yeah. Yeah. But like, basically, I think our total deposits kind of tallied up around there. They t tallied up around 1.5 million. Um, everyone was in the group. I think it was a little bit higher, but a few people dropped out of the group. Um, but yeah, we would have just lost that money. And it wasn't just that money, though. That, that was the thing. We'd have lost that money, but they wanted the full amount. They wanted 100% that was owed to them. So that was just like our deposit. They wanted the full amount of the apartments. So, you know, we everyone would have been out of pocket a lot of money. So that's why we all kind of just stuck together and just pushed forward, pushed forward. Um, but yeah, we had a good result in the end. It sounds like it, doesn't it? But that's it, again, looking at all the options. It's, you know, in property development, property investment, we all know you've got bumps in the road. So many people are so quick to give up. The first little pothole, and let's be honest, living in whatever borough council you live in, we've all got a pothole problem right now. You hit the first pothole and you give up, and that is the sign. You've got no resilience uh, and nothing to move forward in property. Those who prosper and succeed, you know, um, will move forward, you know. The, the only thing that I that I will correct you on is when you said you, you had a small portfolio and you were just trying to get on. I, you know, we all know, Jalil, you've done well for yourself. And indeed, it's it's a huge testament. It's like I said, from the start, you know, you weren't born into it. You didn't go to college to study it, you know, and just to do that off your own back and use the constant resilience. Because, you know, like you were saying, when you have those bundles delivered to you, the court papers, the threats, the, the you know, the, it must have been a, a quite a tense situation for you. Plus, you had, obviously, your parents' house on the line as well, you know, the roof over your parents' heads, you know. But you've, you've managed to pull through. You managed to push at the time and then pull through back the other side now. And we're having quite an interesting conversation, the two of us, uh, a few weeks ago now. And you're starting to reap the rewards of the capital appreciation on your portfolio right now, aren't you? Yeah, but um, I think like that's that's what kind of made me, you know, persevere because I had my parents' house on the line and I couldn't give up. I couldn't give up. I couldn't just give up because it wouldn't just be me, you know, losing out. So I, I just pushed through with it. But one thing that I, I'd like to cover as well, which I probably didn't cover in the webinar, but it was a good point that I should make was because in 2009, 2010, 2011, them three years, I was a motivated seller. So I was a very motivated seller. And, um, you know, Evan, I spoke to, they weren't really giving me a good uh, solution. You know, they were kind of just trying to milk off that I'm, I'm, you know, in this position. And so in 2015, when I um, started to do property and I had a bit of money back from this uh, property in London, I set up my own company, as you know, the office, um, and I was approaching, you know, people who were motivated sellers. But I think the key one made me be successful at doing deals with people where I didn't, you know, loads of lease options and exchange delayed completion was that I understood when these motivated sellers were sat in the office, you know, opposite me um, on the desk and they were telling me their problems. I knew exactly what it felt like to be in their shoes. I know what that pressure felt like. I know what that pain felt like. I, I, had a, I had a kind of understanding of what they're going through with this property because, you know, I, I've been there. So when I was offering them solutions, I was offering them solutions which was fit in their needs. Like when I had my property in London, if, if someone approached me then and said, look, let's do a lease option. I'll buy the property for 250K, which is what it's worth now. And then your 60K in five years time or 10 years time, I'll pay you that back slowly when I refinance the property or something like that. I would have agreed. I would have said, yeah, let's do it. But no one gave me an offer like that. They just wanted a discount. But when I started to speak to people in, you know, 2015, 16, 17, 18, 19, and they, they had, you know, problematic properties, I was able to find a solution because I was looking at, it's not really what they want, it's what they need, what they need from the deal. 
So I was able to give them what they need, but I was giving them terms. I was giving them terms that I knew that I had the capacity and the resources within that time frame to make turn this property around and make it work. And I, I did them. And when I did uh, complete on the deal, um, you know, and people got paid and I paid off their mortgage or, or debts, that kind of gave me the credibility where, you know, they spoke to somebody else. And if somebody else said, oh, did he do a deal with you? And it went through all okay. And they said, yeah, it did. It went through really well. So that's what really helped me, um, you know, build the portfolio quite quickly. Yeah, that's brilliant. At the moment, we've got a lot of people showing on the screen. We've got so many more in the background as well. I want somebody to shout out with a question for Jalil. Don't ring me later and ask me the question. Shout out for Jalil the actual question now. But uh, going back to it now, would you have done anything differently if you could go back in time? Yeah, definitely. If I can go back in time, that first three-bedroom property that I bought for 82000 them properties are now 200 plus in that same area. And I still own a few properties there. I think I've got about three there. Um, but back at that time, going back to 2004, like nearly 20 years ago, it was quite a rundown area, but it's developed massively over the years. Um, it was like a lot of council houses there, but now it's like probably 50, 60% private. And that was really a very, very good strategy because these properties, they were on the market roughly back then about 100,000. Um, because they were ex-council properties and people had bought them cheap off the council, they were all willing to take offers between 80 and 90,000. And they were large properties. They had a drive. You can pack like two cars. They had like three double bedrooms. They had a large garden. And they were decent sized properties, you know, a, a lot of property for your money. And they, it's a huge area. So there were so many of these properties available. If I had just stuck to that, that was within my budget, you know, of buying them, doing them up, selling them. If I had just stuck to that and I continued since 2004 till today, I'd probably be speaking to you from Monaco, from my penthouse apartment, you know, because that was a really good strategy. But, you know, like I said, you don't know what you don't know at the time. And I didn't know that that was a really good strategy. And I started to kind of chase these new build apartments in better areas and then going to London to buy these fancy apartments. But I had a really good strategy that if I just stuck with, and over the years, even if I just done one or two deals a year continuously, they would have still worked today. And I would have had a loss, let headache and, um, you know, probably a, 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 a lot more wealth. Yeah, I mean, fantastic. It's, it, it, it is true, isn't it? You know, I, I think we would all change minor things that we can do. But, but some of the you're doing now, you're obviously sat on obviously what's a, a very good business and, and also a fantastic story, like I've said, you know, the, the dramas, the ups, the downs, etc. in there. Now, I've just seen that uh, Nikki's just popped up. Nikki, would you like to ask a question? Hello, good evening. Would you like to ask Jalil a question? Hi, yeah, I would. He's um, already kind of answered it, but um, I earlier I heard him mention, um, or heard you mention, Shalil, that you go for bigger properties now. Um, I'm just starting out. I was going to ask why bigger properties. Is it because of the HMO or is there another reason? Um, but you, you did already just then say if you were starting out again, you'd have stuck with the smaller ones. Yeah. It's not so much smaller. They were like three or four bed um, properties, the smaller ones. But what I said is that when I um, started to buy again, while I was looking for larger properties, because with larger properties, you've got more scope to add value. So because it's a larger property, you could convert them to multiple units. Yeah. You know, you can convert them to larger HMOs, which was cash flow. Um, but really as well, the end goal is whether you sell or refinance, you're more likely to get a higher valuation because you've added more value to the property. Yeah. And, and one thing as well that I'd say with larger properties, what I did find that sometimes the owners were more agreeable to do a deal because it's a large property and they didn't want the headache of doing it up and not everybody wants to buy it. People are looking for kind of small houses to move straight into or just, you know, do up. So that's why I started to look at large properties, but I still bought, I, I bought really anything that made sense. Okay. But, um, you know, I, I still bought one bed flats, two bed flats, 
but it, it all depended on the deal. You know, if the numbers made sense, if the terms made sense, um, yeah. I'd still do it. Awesome. Thank you very much. No problem. Awesome. Thanks for the question, Nikki. Lovely to see you. And uh, you go. Thank you very much. Uh, Reese, you've popped up. Reese Jones. Hi. No, thank, thanks for sharing that. It was really interesting. Um, my question for you is when you were first starting out, what was sort of the biggest anxiety that you had that turned out to be sort of a, a nothing, a, just a, a sort of monkey on the, on the brain? Yeah, I think when I first started out um, yeah, from 2004, I'd say up until about 2008, to be honest, I was overconfident. I was kind of a bit, you know, full of myself thinking because I'd, I'd got in when it was a rising market and price would just go up. I just thought that there's no way you could um, lose out on property. I was making, 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 making. Um, but it's only when the recession kicked in and I've never been in a recession before. It was my first recession and it was a big recession and I was kind of knees deep in it. And I was, um, you know, at that time I was kind of, it was all new to me. So I didn't know what, what was around the corner. Um, but like, do you I think, think that was obviously education. A, sorry. Do you think that was a, not having the the education and the experience to go with it at the beginning yeah definitely um you know i i, I was really new to it. at that time i think i was like 23 years old you know 22 23 so i was really green um and i didn't even know there was property education out there i had no idea i was just completely oblivious to it was actually people who teach you how to invest into property properly um i was just doing it on my own um but like i think i you know, when I got them court papers, I was obviously thinking oh, I'm going to be bankrupt, you know. Um, but then I think one key thing that happened as well at that time in 2009, 2010, I did notice that, you know, there was a lot of people still buying properties. So even where we are in Cardiff as a capital, you know, there was still a demand. And there was, I seen like people buying. And I could remember just kind of looking at these properties and I'd see a sale board. And then a couple of weeks later, I'll see a sold on it and I think who who's buying these properties like who's buying properties in this kind of market so I was always questioned like if it's so bad why are people buying for so that's when I realized that maybe there's something I don't know because people were getting good deals at that time um, yeah. so yeah w w when I started to attend property events and network and learn about them you know that's when I kind of started to believe that I can apply these uh, strategies myself um, and make them work but yeah like one fear was just thinking that everything was going to go wrong and in the end it didn't um, but yeah it was a big okay. learning curve yeah no for sure no thank you for that that's brilliant thanks Reese. thanks for the question there uh, I think it's on a lot of people's minds you know a lot of people do have anxiety they do have fears it's fear of the unknown more than anything isn't it Fear of anything mm -hmm. is something you don't know anything about. And a lot of it boils down to education. A lot of it boils down to getting yourself in the right kind of mindset as well, because you are going to have to take on a battle at some point. Mm -hmm. And anybody who's been successful in property that tells you they've never had a battle, well, they either aren't successful or they're just lying. <laughs> it's a simple fact, isn't it? But uh, yeah, I mean, you know, that story is fantastic. Does anyone else... Hidden away, yeah, anyone else on our screen right now? Because we've got a lot more participants than are showing on the screen right now. Does anyone have a question for Jalil? Um, what a fantastic presentation it has been this evening. We've really enjoyed it ourselves. Um, anyone else? If there are any further questions, I'm sure Jalil will, will be happy to talk to anyone. Uh, he's a very approachable guy. That's why I invite him on tonight. Very proud to have him as a good friend of mine. We enjoy meals out together. Uh, we always enjoy... yeah. The old-fashioned phrase, chewing the fat. But no, we've got to nice restaurants now. We've done all right. Um, <laughs> but yeah, Reese, you're back. I, I am. I'm sorry about that. No, please. <laughs> it's, it's, it's lovely. And anyone else on here, please do not feel uh, anxious or fearful about starting your property journey or indeed asking a question. If you do want to ask a question and you don't want to turn your camera on, 
please just shout out after Reese has asked his, his next question or questions. Please it's, feel free just to shout out to us because I'm sure just they'll a, all help. Just a quick one. So where um, where can we sort of meet you and speak to you? Are you, are you often at these sort of events or do you shy away from them a little bit? I imagine that you probably wouldn't. Yeah, to be honest, yeah, this is my first ever webinar. Never done a webinar. I done one podcast uh, with a friend a couple of years ago, but I'm quite a private person. You know, that, yeah. like, my definition of success is privacy, you know, having yeah. privacy and peace, you know. Um, so that's why, like, last year I took the whole year off. And, um, you know, I am a quite private person, but if someone drops me a message and, you know, I, I can genuinely help them, I will. Um, but I don't really put myself out there um i'm just not that type of person yeah no for sure no thanks for that i can arrange personal meetings with mr jerome it'll cost you 997 pounds <laughs> plus vat <laughs> no we can yeah, i thought you might say that <laughs> yeah um no well it's been an absolutely fantastic meeting um just wait on anyone else now anyone else has got anything to say Any, anyone else has got a question for us something that we have talked about before is uh what we call our concord club it's a new innovation that we've been designing and basically this this concord club is out there to help anyone who's new anyone who's in property anyone looking to scale or anyone looking to get a little bit better in property. What the Concord Club, it's a monthly subscription, and there'll be a full access to multi-strategy training video library. So what that means is that we've got a multi-strategy library of videos to help you. So if your chosen strategy is BRR, if it's SA, if it's rent to rent, whatever the case it might be, we've got the full access of tuitional videos for you. We're also going to start holding weekly topical strategy-based webinar with a full question and answer session. So we'll have lovely people like Jalil who have walked the walk come with us and explain exactly what you need to know, answer any questions for you. We've also got priority ac access to our expert finance broker who is just popped up on the screen now, Jamie French. Jamie deals with mortgages, he deals with commercial mortgages, he deals with bridging loans, he deals with short-term finance, insurance, the list is endless. You've got priority access to Jamie and his team at Notebook Money. You've got priority access through uh, our network and my guys to property deals. Primarily within the South Wales region, uh, the MP postcode region. We've also, over the years, because of our volume, of refurbishments we've also got priority access to trade supplies so you'll actually get trade supplies below trade prices and of course with that comes full access to trades and professional services so if you need uh, for example a roofer a carpenter a plumber a heating engineer electrician chartered surveyor if you need um, a building surveyor if you need damp proof, whatever you need, we have it all here for you. So if you are interested in subscribing to the Concord Club to either get yourself into property or to scale your property business, we're all ears. We'd love to hear from you. Please drop me a message. My contact details are here. I'd love to hear from you. So if you've got any questions, queries, anything that's been said tonight, love to hear from you. Um, what I must do is obviously, before we log off, allow Jamie his platform here. Hmm. Uh, I'm not very talkative today, guys. I've got uh, a little one. Let me say, first of all, thank you to Jalil. It's a little newborn. Um, oh, baby Leo. So I'm not very talkative today. Um, I think that for me, it's not really, this is like, uh, I want to thank my mum, my dad, uh, mama, but not really as such. Um, Jalil, I think, is a very knowledgeable person. We spoke once at one of, at one of the events. You come to one of the events? So, yeah, he does show up, he, but he shows up late with a coffee and then hides at the back. Um, mm -hmm. So, you have to you have to be quick to know he didn't come. Um, but for me, I think the group is better the more we talk and speak to each other. Um, 
So thank you, Jalil, for sharing your story. I'm sure there'll be lots of questions. There's a few people in here that I work with already who have asked stuff. Um, I, I've got one question for you, Jalil, I think. Um, and how do I word this question is, um, lots of people forget running property and being a landlord is a business. Mm -hmm. um, is a business and something you focused on earlier on was what you said was if the numbers work the deal not getting emotionally attached mm -hmm. um, when did you stop becoming emotionally attached about property as I well oh I've got to buy this one it's the numbers mm -hmm. don't work move on I think it was from 2015 from 2015 I, I to be honest I every one property I, I bought I probably turned down you know four or five and I, I, there's so many times where I've actually, you know, looked at something I was really, you know, I've spent money on it, uh, valuations, you know, solicitors, for everything to buy it. And then I just realized it didn't make sense. So I've just stepped back. Uh, you know, e even recently, this happens quite often. Um, but yeah, just take the emotion out of it and just look at the numbers and think of it, you know, a long-term investment and, if it all works, then move forward. If it doesn't, just wait until the next one comes around. So I think that's very important for people to understand because I see this all the time where people have spent a couple of hundred quid up front on a survey and some searches. They're like, I've spent, spent 800 pounds now and committed because they feel mm -hmm. like they, they've invested so much on that 800 pounds. Um, one, one question that I'd like to elaborate on potentially is, uh, with my clients, I tend to ask them to focus on a rent roll. Did you focus on properties or a rent roll that you wanted to achieve per month, per year? Yeah, I think it was the rent roll. I wanted the cash flow. I wanted cash flow because originally when I started, I was trying to get, um, you know, just the, the lumps of money. And then what I kind of envisioned was that I want to achieve a certain amount of cash flow. So I get paid, you know, all the time, you know, and that's, that, that's what I did aim for. I, and I achieved that last year. I kind of hit my target. So I was able to take the year off. Um, but yeah. And at the same time, as I was building cash flow, what I started to realize was building a lot of equity as well, because the last few years property has been going, you know, in a very good direction, but it's been going up except probably last year and this year now. Um, when it's a bit choppy, but I was aiming for cash flow, which I did build. But in that process, I did build a lot of equity of, along with it. Okay. So, do you plan to have capital events by disposing property, or you long term hold them? Yeah. At, at at the moment, I'm I'm quite fortunate that all the properties that I've kept um, are in very good locations, and the rental demand is high. So. I've got no plans to sell them, but if I did uh, find something that I thought was better than the investment I got now, then I've had them for a, you know a while and I've made um, you know quite a bit of money off them. I wouldn't mind selling them. I'm not emotionally attached to any of them. Um, that I, I wouldn't sell them if I did, you know if I if I had to, I'd sell them. Okay. Um... Sorry, it's a madhouse here, guys. I've got a newborn little one, dog. Um, this is what you call life under the thumb. Um, I don't have any other questions, to be honest with you. Thank you for your time. I've really enjoyed it. Uh, oh, Ben coming back on that hurt. I don't know if that hurt anyone else. Um, <laughs> but is anyone, Jamel, you, uh, Jalil, are you coming on the 21st? We haven't officially said the 21st. A live event, are you coming on the 21st? Is that Newport? Yeah. On... Well, we might be holding them in Cardiff very soon as well. Okay. In, not Cardiff, Ponty Parade. We might have a venue there as well. Um, the So we may have a venue. Sorry, everyone wants to come say hello. No? I'm going to get to say hello, everyone, just so he gets used to being on camera. Hello. Um, say hello. hello. Wave. No, wave so the camera can see you. Say hi, everybody. <laughs> they say you must use Jamie for finance. Say that. Yeah. No, okay. How <laughs> brilliant. I've got no hope, have I? No hope. No. Absolutely um, fantastic. So yeah, the one on Newport may have a venue in Pontypridd soon. 
Uh, we like to obviously try to mix up a little bit. Brilliant. Okay. Well, guys, anyone else got any questions? You've got to be quick because I'm going to say our goodbyes now. Our first major thank you is to Jalil for coming here and providing the entertainment this evening. It was so content rich. It was so entertaining. And it just shows everyone. And there's a couple of people I, I do probably a quarter of my business is uh, mentorship now, uh, mentorship in property investment and development. There's a couple of my mentees who are on here this evening. And it's great that obviously Jalil has echoed what I've been trying to, to say for so long is perseverance, uh, never give up, you know, never have an emotional attachment towards the property. And let's look at it as a business. And that's what we all, all do here. So guys, thank you for everybody who's taken the time out of their evening and missed the television this evening. Well, there was nothing good on anyway. This was far better. And uh, Jamie, thank you so much. Thank you for bringing Leo. Thank you for bringing your other boys. Uh, thank you for bringing the dog. Um, you know, it's been absolutely fantastic. Jalil, you've been wonderful. Your story's amazing. Everyone here wants to meet you. And indeed, thank you so much, guys. Any questions about Concord Club, any questions for Jalil, we'd be more than happy to answer. Uh, I think we've got a hand up, actually. We've got a hand up. V, 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 v. Hello. Hello. Good evening. Right. Yeah, no, sorry. That was just a, um, an applause symbol I was doing there. Oh, right. Oh, questions. No questions? Sorry. No, no, but good. Thanks very much for the presentation. Good info. Nice to share the story. Um, th this is my first um, uh, South Wales Property Investing Group webinar also. So uh, and next time I'll be a bit more prepared because I didn't know what the format was today, but I'm sure I have questions next time. No problem. If you do get any more questions, please feel free. Just contact us. You've got our contact details. Please feel free to contact us. We're always available and it'd be lovely to reach out, connect and network. So guys, again, Jill, as I say, thank you so much. It's been great. Uh, it's Nikki here. I um, hope this is okay. Sorry, I didn't, couldn't ask before my um, middle child's got ADHD and she's having a bad afternoon. Um, but I have about a billion questions. Is it okay if I shoot maybe like one or two of them over to Jalil, please? Jalil, if you're fine with it, we're fine with it. That's what this webinar's here for, Nikki. So yeah, if, that's if they want to ask the questions, please do. Fab, thank you. Um, yeah, thank you so much for this, all of you. <laughs> that's fine. Have you got a question, Nikki, or? I would, but um, I'm not sure if you can hear that in the background as well. Just say, what you just say. That's fine. If you've got a question and you need to ask it at a later date, that's absolutely fine. Fab, sorry. Noisy children. Cheers. It's no problem. You got to worry when you've got quiet children. Can I ask a question, please? Five pounds, please. Who, who, are we, who are we coming from now? Azad. Azad, yes. Uh, Azad, welcome. Welcome, welcome to the group. Thank you. Please, please do. Um, I was just going to ask uh, about, you know, the new tax laws or, you know, uh, for buy-to-lets and things like that that have come into Wales. So how is that affecting, you know, buy-to-lets or investments in Wales at the moment? Okay, Azad, thanks for the question. First and foremost, I must say that neither myself, Jamie, or Jalil are actually accountants. So we can obviously try and answer your question, but we can't give advice of that nature. Um, Jalil, how has it affected you? Um, it has affected me. Uh, I've obviously got um, quite high interest on some property that I got in my personal name, but since uh, 2016, I think it was, um, everything I've bought has been limited companies. So it's it's been all right, um, you know. It's just normal as it was before. Um, so it, it hasn't affected me that much, um, but you know, for different people, obviously, it's different. Can I ask a, a question off the back of that? Sorry, uh, mm -hmm. Jalil, do you do your own taxes, or do you have an accountant? No, I have an accountant. Okay. 
Okay, and I, I think that's what I just wanted. I, I was hoping you'd say that. I was really hoping. <laughs> um, is that it's really important to understand people try to get these free answers from people and people are giving your opinion. I'll give you, I'll give you my example, for instance. My tax structure is very different from the average person because I've got money coming in from different sources and different types of income. So the way I structure my income will be the different way Jalil will structure his income. Um, and everyone's circumstances are different. And not only that, everyone's legacy planning is different. So while it's great to get uh, people's thoughts and feedback, and it's really important so you can hold a conversation, uh, you, an accountant won't cost you anything. That's not true. An accountant is a bean, uh, bean counter. You want a tax specialist, depending on your personal circumstances, that will save you money. So if, if they charge you a thousand pounds, but they're, they're saving you five thousand pounds, that hasn't really cost you anything. So um, there's a few tax specialists. My accountant is taking work back on. He said the other day, he says this to me all the time. And then when I speak to him, he's like, I'm not taking on any more accountants, uh, any more clients. So, but speak to an accountant. I cannot echo that enough effectively. Yeah, I think that's always fantastic news. You've got to find an expert and somebody that's special in that particular area because, like I just said, um, wasn't a disclaimer as such, but it was a disclaimer to say that obviously we can't issue financial advice in that capacity because we're not qualified to do so. Um, I've got S iPhone, S apostrophe S iPhone. Uh, hi. And... Yes, hi, Sue. Sorry. Sue, hi, thank you. Yeah, and welcome. I miss... I miss most of the webinar of the work and then getting to new ports a bit late. But anyway, thank you. Um, this is my first time joining this webinar. So I just want to ask about the accountants. And um, would you employ or look to have an accountant from the first property investment? And is that by the end of the year, that's when you need an accountant or do you need to talk to somebody at the start of the process. So I am in early stages of the process of purchasing my first buy to let through limited company, but I'm not clear. I haven't had time to ring somebody and just have a chat yet. So I thought it'd be nice to ask the experts. Can I answer that? Yeah. Yes. Um, and I guarantee if you ask me, well, you've just asked everyone that question. I guarantee if you ask me, I'll give you an answer. Jaleel will have an answer. And Ben will have an answer um, because everyone's circumstance is different. Uh, having an initial chat with an accountant doesn't mean you need to appoint an accountant, but mm -hmm. you don't go on a journey without setting your sat nav. So if you're going on a property journey, why are you not having the, the advice from the beginning so you know how to get to your destination? So personally, um, and I say this, and the only reason I say this is we, do, we save a lot of people um, with their financial services. And I mean a lot of people, people are about to have their houses repossessed or they're drunk and they bought online on auction. You won't be surprised how often that happens. It happens a lot. Um, and they come to us and we've got a week to get things done. Because you haven't planned, it actually ends up costing more because your options yeah. are limited and you're making rash decisions. So from my perspective, Jalil may say something different. I would say speak to someone. I don't mean you have to instruct them, but get a plan and understand where you want to end up effectively. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll just add I'll just add something on to that you know like e even as I uh, you know spoke about my journey really there's a lot more people behind it than just me like my accountant my solicitor my broker my architect my builder the agent like it's always good to have professional people on your team and I would always say right from the very start and when you've got these people on your team it's more likely that you'll build a successful business because without these people you'll be figuring out and making a lot of costly mistakes so it's always good to get professional people on your team from the very start hundred percent i mean can't agree with that more you know like jamie said start your journey with the sat nav planning there's no harm in it you know most accountants will actually offer you a sort of free introductory call where you can establish whether you get on with that particular person, whether you want to work with that particular person and whether their field of expertise is if you're going into property, for example, if they're an accountant who is familiar with property too. So I think that's absolutely brilliant. Yeah. Anyone else got any questions? People are slowly coming out. 
Anyone else? Nope. We've hit that level now. But what a great presentation this evening. What a wonderful way to spend a Tuesday evening. Um, I look forward to our in-person meet. Again, Jamie, it's the 21st, isn't it? Uh, I've just been corrected on text message, potentially the 22nd, because the 21st is a Saturday, I think. Right. We need to find out then quickly. We need to find uh, out quickly. So basically, we're just waiting on uh, a speaker to confirm. And I know Nikki's got a hand up and she's going to probably ask, is it always going to be on the weekend? Or are we going to film them? That's my guess and my prediction. Um, the speakers is the... Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> that was my two-year-old. Um, yeah, quick question for Jalila, if we've got time. Of course we have. Always so got time. The most, most burning one. Um, what kind of percentage, um, Jalil, would you say of your properties you rent out and what percentage do you then sell on? Um, and how do you tell the difference? How do you know which one's going to be rich? Um, the last seven or eight years, I haven't sold any. I've kept them all. I've just refinanced them. Um, okay. So I've built the portfolio, uh, like I said earlier, for cash flow. Okay. Sorry. I thought you'd said that, but I just wanted to chat. Thank you. Mum, look. That's okay. Mum, look. Any more questions from anyone for Jilla? Nope. Everyone's silent. Everyone's Can I ask a favour for people? Uh, sorry, just to add one thing. And this will be the last thing because I've got to feed my son. Um, is um, we do South Wales property investments and you don't see us selling millions of courses like other groups. You don't see us trying to charge for the events or for these. Uh, as a, a bit of a favour, could I just ask if you could just put a comment in the group saying you've enjoyed it if you have, or any feedback if you haven't, or if you want to see more, if you didn't like something, um, because the more people that do it, the better it is for everyone. It's so important to connect and meet other people um, that I'd really appreciate if you just took a moment. Um, and to thank Jalil as well within the group. Um, like, he's taking time out this evening. He's not being paid. Um, Ben's promised them a meal, I think. Mm. Um, but that's all I could ask if I could just ask if you enjoyed it leave a comment, if you haven't enjoyed it leave a comment, um, if you want to see something different, leave a comment because we try to help where we can Awesome, well guys, thank you so much, for everyone that's participated this evening, thank you thank you, and for Jamie thank you so much, thank you for bringing your family with you as well and for Jalil, of course ultimate thanks for your wonderful presentation. I knew it would be good. I just knew it would be good. Watch out, Nikki's back. Hello, good evening. Oh, how cute. Hello, hello, good evening. Wonderful, wonderful. I really guys. have to leave you guys because my son is going to need his bottle now. So, well, thank you much, guys. We're going to call an evening for everyone now. And just like I say, thanks to everyone. And our contact details are here. And we'll speak soon. Thanks very much indeed, guys. Wishing you all the very best. Prosperous future to everyone. Thank you. Bye now.